I'm back in America. This is my first show uh, since having been back a couple of months now. And I know you see the beautiful, handsome, young black king sitting next to me. I will elaborate with about him and who he is in a moment. But I'm gonna continue with my ritual, okay? Cause you know how we do it. Um, let's first give thanks to the almighty creator that saw that we were worthy to come together, to continue to dispel the lies and the, and the uh, turbulence that we face from day to day in our community and in this nation as a whole. Without the creator, we are not. So we give thanks for the creator for giving us health and strength and a new day to do the work. And as we all know, those that have been watching the show for some time now, you know that my friend, Early Laverne, ancestor, is why I was inspired to do this show. Because oftentimes uh, we have stories to tell, but there's no one to tell it. And his life was very riveted over the years, the things he went through, uh, is more than tongue can tell. <laughs> um, and over the, I've only known him for two years, from 2011 to 2013, in which he passed away. And but he was a poet, and he was many other things. But he was a poet, and he willed his poetry to me. So as you know, I always start off with one of his poems, and end with one of mine. But I have a treat for you today, okay? I'm not gonna tell you, but I have a treat for you all today. Today, his poem will be built to stand and will not fall. And I will elaborate on that in a moment. Now, before I move into doing the work for the people, I would like those that have not subscribed to do so now. And if you find I'm work, the work I'm doing is beneficial, then please visit my YouTube studio and view the over 40 topics of enlightening conversation that I've conducted in the past year. Yes, I've been at it one year. I have over 43 shows. I'm sure you'll find them educational and inspirational. So take a moment, thumbs up, share, and leave a comment. Today's topic will be, what happened to our love? I have to pause on that. What happened to our love? And what is the ramification of a loveless race? So, I will read. My ancestral friend, Early Laverne's poem built to stand and will not fall. Developing as a child, I did childish things. Reaching maturity, I now think as a king. I am now secured in my destiny call, built to stand and will not fall. I will soar to incredible heights, disposing of obstacles with all my might, my physical being often grows uptight. However, not anything can induce my powerful insight. Needless to say, I've been born a success. My past failing doesn't make me anyone less. I know very clearly my direction. I'm geared toward one day reaching perfection. My increase in progress is on the ball, built to stand and will not fall. The essence of my mission is to gain a loving heart. I am that symbol of a beautiful park. <laughs> I'm planting into this world some powerful seeds. My focus is centered around my people's needs. I shall not hesitate to give my all. Built to stand and will not fall. I shall. I shall, I shall, I shall. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
yes, 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 my brethren. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to do something that I started not long ago. As we move forward, I'm going to break it up, okay? And uh, because I know people's time is valuable, and I just want to give you the meat and the potato, or let's say the vegetarian stuff, in short breaks, okay? So we're going to talk for a minute, then I'm going to break it, and then we'll continue on the other end. Not now, though. So just going to open up. In, um, I'm going to begin by first honoring my guest. As you see that he's sitting here. Uh, my guest today is Brother Chris Kuhn a.k.a. Brother Coon. Yes, Coon. C-O-O-N. That is his name. And our brother is very talented. Um, I hope he will uh, be able to do one of his poems because he's a poet. He's a motivational speaker. And he's and for him to be a motivational speaker, you know, he's had to have gone through something worth talking about. Mm -hmm. So as we progress in our conversation, he's going to elaborate a little bit about who he is and why he feels it important for you to hear his story. Um, so I want to first thank you very much for being a part of this program. Mm -hmm. Um, and for being vulnerable. Thank you for having me, and thank you for uh, setting the space yes. for vulnerability, yes. um, for masculine vulnerability. Yes. Thank you. I thank you for um, for having me, and I also thank you for creating the space um, for uh, for a black for black men for black people, and for and for right now for this black man to be able to drop his shoulders. Yes, and to be able to be vulnerable and be transparent and to just be able to breathe without um, feeling like I'm under attack, feeling right. like I have to be, I have to have my guard up yes. or I have to put on a facade yes. so that way I don't, uh, I'm not seen as weak. Oh. So thank you for the rest. Thank you. Audience, did you hear what he just said? Mm. You see, our world is... Uh, when we see each other in the world, we're not really showing up oftentimes with our authentic self. And it's not because we don't want to, but it's actually a shield to protect our heart and our vulnerability. So uh, today, I hope to dispel the lies that we are worthy to come out with who we are. Huh? So I, I am pushing forward today to just kind of speak and ask the right questions to reveal the power of what it means to be a black man in this country and what they go through from day to day and the effects of it on black love, mm. on the family, on the community, and on the nation as a whole. You know, this is his story we will be exploring today and hearing his point of view. But uh, the word his story will be mentioned in many different ways here. So I'm gonna back it up a little bit before I go further. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk. In, many, in my many seasons of living in the skin of a black woman, I can recall yearning for love and companionship. Sometimes it was for, it was for my father's love. I know that love is often the foundation of seeing our worth. And when it's practiced in our home, it then becomes easier to thrive. The making of love in our earliest of days oftentimes were our inward search for acceptance. For if your home front was grounded in all that we required emotionally, then we would put sex and young parenting in its place and time. Oftentimes, the scenario goes as such. To be madly in love is when we lay down to make love. Somehow, when we arose, 
that was with child and no father. So there's an element of us mistaking love for being young mothers, for giving up our sacredness to each other. Now, I'm not going to get it wrong. You know, the body will do what the body does. It, it's a procreation system when we got. But when we have the healthy mind behind it that unless I'm willing to walk that lengthy years with you, then, you know, I'm going to value who I share it with and when I share it. So the young girls are often running from home, running to find love. And they sometimes find, you know, that love ends up with them being young mothers. And uh, the young mothers is not just a young mother of a little boy. It's also, uh, yeah, of course, I, I should say a little girl, but a boy too. And, you know, we have to give birth to both, right? So, but the challenge becomes raising children by ourselves and the effects of that on our people, our home, our culture, our community. So the narrative I described has become a norm for a large population of black women and men alike. And because she got only gives birth, like I said, to females, not, not just only to females, but to males too, that dynamic is what we feel and see happening ongoingly in our community. So I, I come to ask, what is the origin of our pain that has created black men and black women's relationship built on divisiveness to now be considered the norm? You know, what is the origin? Where did it begin? And before we even delve into that, I'm just setting the stage, everyone. That's what I'm doing by just kind of laying out some things that I, I feel that we need to start opening our minds to think about. Because oftentimes we, we are blaming each other. But there's a quote that I have from a clinical psychologist by the name of Harriet Lerner. And I just thought this was a pretty good quote to repeat. In our rapidly changing society, we can count on only two things that will never change. What will never change is the will to change and the fear of change. It is the will to change that motivates us to seek help. It is the fear of change that motivates us to resist the very help we need. So I kind of feel sometimes that we're just moving the problem around and shuffling around like a ball into one generation to the next. But we have to really decide that we want to make some changes and go deeply in doing it. Yeah. So that said, tell me what has made you say yes to my invitation to talk about black men and women's relationship out loud. Um, yeah, um, I think what it, well, I know what it was is um, this has been a topic that's been heavy on my heart for a while now. I would say um, actively about 10 years. Okay. Um, that's kind of when the seed was planted of when I realized like, whoa, um, when I would say like one of my I don't want to. I don't want to call everything heartbreak that, but right. but one of the relationships that like really, I would say, ruptured my system and really yes. caused me to go to probably one of my deepest um, depressions and really, honestly, um, get me to my highest space of like being able to actively love, right? Okay. Like really got me, like made me do the healing work, right. but it was a process. Um, and it was a lot of numbing that came with that process. Mm. There was a lot of like darkness that came with that process. A lot of a lot of the, you know, we're taught that when things hurt us, to go numb to yes. prevent that thing from hurting us. Correct. Um, Say that again. We're, we're taught that when uh, when things hurt us, to go numb, especially as men, as young men, as boys. If you you know 
don't cry even if it hurts. Yes. We're, we're not taught to acknowledge pain. And so the only other recourse is actually um, going numb. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna speak about that in a second. I'm actually a, a, also a gunshot trauma survivor mm. um, who experienced paralysis. Mm. And so- Gunshot trauma, trauma survivor. survivor. Yeah, we can speak about it a little bit more. I was actually, okay. um, I, was, I was shot three times walking home from school. Um, How old were you at the time? 15 years old. 15 years old. Yeah, and, um, and so from that, Audience, did you hear that? Yeah. We must take a break mm. just on that thought and what he just shared. Mm. Mm. A moment of silence because we're looking at a survivor. Mm. Okay, my brother. Okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, and it's and you could probably tell like quite often. I'm used to sharing that and hurrying through. Yes. Right? Because I learned after a while, as much as people will be like, oh, really? Oh my God. Yes. Um, after a while, it, as much as that is an acceptable trauma, it become, it's becoming more of a thing to where, okay, but don't, but, but you have to get over it, right? And it's one of those things where I've, I've done my work and I still do my work yes. daily. Every day is a work. I do my personal development. Yes. I do my, my prayers, my meditation, my mindfulness, my Tai Chi, um, yoga, anything um, at this at this point. And that work didn't start till I experienced and endured a heartbreak that like sat me down, <laughs> right? And that sit down caused for me that I had all the stuff came up. And this was at 23. Okay. This was so you were able to be in a relationship that allowed you to be vulnerable and exhale and let out all that you had held in. Yeah, and then get gut punched. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, yeah, so the moment of feeling okay, somebody cares, I'm safe here. I'm going to actually attempt to go against the grain of my programming yes. and I'm going to love actively mm -hmm. and I'm going to love her. Didn't know and not, didn't didn't um, didn't know that like <laughs> I didn't account for her traumas, yes. right? Of course, these are new terminologies: trauma, mental health, um, you know, adverse childhood experiences, um, and things that are acceptable. When I say acceptable trauma, you have acceptable traumas. You have things like gunshot traumas, acceptable car accidents. Oh, of course, you know they need time. But what about when your parents divorce? Mm -hmm. Right, and so for her, she experienced that. She experienced her mother's pain, yeah. and although, and not to harp so much on her, but I had to process like, why was she, why did she have this energy toward right. me? Right. Why or, did it stop when you needed her the most? When you disclosed your pain. Right. So. You see? Yeah. yeah. And this was back in twenty. You know, just being clear, because of course I've journeyed through a few right, um, right. relationships, um, but that was the one that caused for me to like really. Um, reevaluate myself and make a decision. Right. Simultaneously, um, I'm living at home with my parents yes. and I'm watching their relationship always been, I, yeah. I'll use the word catastrophic, right, you know, just dysfunctional, but right. functional, right? Um, because I remember as a kid, two, three years old, them fighting, arguing, constantly fighting over and just using, and like I said, we won't be transparent uh, because a lot of people don't know Right. These parts of the story, and I know I swing from bank, from branch to branch. All right, that's so, okay because um, you know that's the way of our lives, yeah. really. And I'm, so I'm gonna try to make sure we tie it all together because it really all is connected. Um, but I remember uh, my parents fighting over the phone, over the telephone, and I'm sitting in my high chair, um, and then them hitting a bottle of hot sauce and it splashing in my eye mm. um, at two, maybe three at the most. Um, and I remember always like when they would fight, when they would argue, when my mother would cry. And I had a, I had a brother who was two years older. My brother would tend to busy himself with video game TV or like hide himself from it. Is he older? Was he older than you? Two years older. Okay. And I tend to be right for whatever reason. I felt it deeper. Right. It hurt me deeper. Right. right? It, uh, I wanted to comfort my mother. And even in that, and even in that, I remember 
my mother closing the door and when I would try to come in and like, it's going to be okay the way she would do me. Right. She, um, <laughs> her pushing me away because being seen in her vulnerability, yeah. right, was not, didn't make her feel powerful, right? right? Even, and I didn't realize, and I, I brought that up because I didn't realize how much that was a thing until I grew more into a man. Yes. And I'm like, oh. That's what she was worried about, that you would see her as not being a strong woman and the effects of that. And when I look at, like, a lot of the dynamics, the relationships that I attracted, um, there was, there's a lot of similarities, mm -hmm. things that stem back to like yes. my mother um, and, and my father. Now, I made a decision because I, I saw the pain. And my dad left when I was three, came mm -hmm. back when I was seven. Mm -hmm. um, he was my favorite person yes. up until he came back. Okay. When he came back, I saw him for, he became like one of my villains, yeah. right? my dragon. But really what it is, and I idolized my dad. Yes. He was the coolest thing in the world. But then I, and I didn't know why he was attacking me. Why he was a monster. <sighs> Come on. You know, like why gotta... he was a monster. <laughs> like, what's up with, like, and I'm yeah. like, yo, I just want to be around you. I want to be with you. I want to, like, I want to go everywhere with you. So let me ask you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is your father still alive? He is. Are you close? <laughs> We're not. Okay. Do you know his story from when he was young? So part of my healing journey was me actually taking a journey, um, which I did. And this is a part being a spoken word artist, you know, an edutainer. Yeah. Writer, um, I was able to, I was able to hide my healing journey inside my work, right inside my my tour. Right. So I went to the East Coast. I drove from here all the way to the East Coast, performing from stage to stage yes. to stage. I didn't realize till midway through my journey I was actually following my father's path. Mm. So when he left me, he would left, when he left us when I was three, he actually went back to his father's house and I ended up at my grandfather's house. Wow. So I got to really talk to him and he told you his story. <sighs> my dad, so my dad, he was back, he was back with my mother. He came back when I was seven. And so that's another part. Not understand like understanding her brokenness yeah. and taking back things that yeah. devalue you and understand and trying to understand his brokenness and not being able to be not being able to love your family, right. not being able to love yourself. Right. Like at 24, I was like really starting to do that work. But this was after that relationship had blew up, right? After the pain, after all the manipulation, okay. after all, and me realizing that, wow, she really had a vendetta against me. Be Who, mother? No, the, my your, ex, your, your ex. My ex, right? Okay, for you to have gone and t continued what had the journey that had occurred yeah. in your house. And I almost created, I almost continued my mother's path. And I'm right. going to talk about it in the poem okay. that I wrote. My okay. mother's path of of taking, of, of the forgiving heart. Right. I've carried my mother's heart. Yes. Right? Yeah. So the, okay, I'll give mm -hmm. you another ch second chance. Yeah. And sometimes we, we, we lose count. Yeah. <laughs> um. So let me ask, did your father stay with your mom till you become, till you grew up? Or? They're still together to this day. Okay. Even in all the... Has their love <laughs> and their uh, problems... all the dysfunction. Has it healed? No. It's still the same? It's still, it's still, okay. it's, if not even, probably even, I would say there's levels to, like, it's it worse and numb yeah. to where it just becomes a, he's going to do what he's going to do. Yeah. Um, it has gotten to a point to where things have gotten like really really bad you know what I mean yeah. and then as a grown man and that being my mother that being what I you know as young boys were taught to that's the first person we're sworn to protect that we yeah. swear to protect so of course as a you know coming back you know from the east coast and having more understanding of why my dad battled with drugs mm -hmm. and the numbing and where that came from did that come from his father my grandfather does not mess with drugs at all no but Sometimes it's not what the grandfather did, it's what he didn't do. It, you it, know, the, the lack of affirmation, the lack of, that's why I say he, love begins in the household that gives the confidence for the individual to step out and do certain things. But what, we, what I learned mm -hmm. is about my family, and that was always the family I always longed to be. I, was, I wasn't raised on my dad's side. Mm -hmm. That's my coom side of the family. Yeah. And they, the reason why I uphold my, my name with so much respect is because they did. Yes. Right? Um, 
And after like spending one my first Thanksgiving, I saw it. I saw my cousin go to the store and smoke a cigarette to sit after cigarette. Bottle after come on, cuz we just gonna we're gonna wine bottle after wine bottle to numb from the control system. The control, family control. The, the, the elders. The, the judgment from okay. the elders. The for the moment that and I was and she was always my cousin, she was four years older than me. She was always the youngest at the time. Okay. And I would then I come and then I'm there. She's like, Cuz, I'm so glad that you're here because she was always the only one <laughs> that was they had her sitting at the kids' table. She's in her thirties. Right. And so and I watched and I sat I'm sitting, I'm like, wow, we just been here for two hours and y'all all y'all have done is just been picking back and forth, picking us apart. What you gonna when you gonna do something with your hair? And what you gonna do? How long you gonna yeah, you gonna be yeah. you gonna uh, be in school? Yeah. How long you gonna do this? You know you can't so What part of this is the South? This is this is like Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Where, that's where uh, so my grandfather was born in a small town, Clarion, Pennsylvania. And then he resides currently still, still alive. It's Dr. Coon. Shout out to my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Um but this truth gotta get out. We gotta because it's mm -hmm. it's affecting generations. Yes. Um and he was he was Air Force, he was military. Okay. So my father also was military. I was born on a military base. Okay. My grandfather was Air Force. My father was Army. Okay. So he came out here um, in the Army, and he actually met my mother while he was in the Army. Um, up up on, uh, on Mac Road, that's where they used to house. So the place that's known in what our generation called Iraq, yeah. right? It was also um, once upon a time country was village, but now Providence place um, was was the place they would house the soldiers. Mm. Valley High was actually a neighborhood built. It was actually a nice neighborhood until the end of the crack era in the 90s. So we're talking about the southern part of Sacramento yeah, for those that are in Africa and yeah. different parts of the world. Which no. So he's kind of elaborate. Hopefully your voice is oh, trailing. Yeah, yeah hopefully. Hear Can y'all hear me? My bad. I, I actually, believe it or not, fun fact about me, although I speak with power on stage, and this comes from some of the conditioner. I am naturally soft spoken. Yes. And that's something as a kid that would get me in trouble. Yeah. Um, gentle soul. <laughs> you could see his gentleness coming out because, you know, I've given him permission mm -hmm. as a woman, as a mother, as an elder yeah. to speak his truth. Yeah. <laughs> you see, because that's the problem. Our men have so much they are carrying around and they're not allowed to be vulnerable. You know, and so they put on that mask, they push puff, puff up that chest, and they go through life acting like they are strong. Yeah. And they're not allowed to cry. Yeah. You know, and I still don't know why. Mm. Okay, but one thing I do know that we often find uh, that we don't uh, ask the question of is from whence we came and what is that connection as a people, a captive people in America. You know, when you think about the, the African Americans, the black people that live in this country. Now, those that have watched my show, you know that I've been talking about that. I've showed you the slave dungeons mm. at Cape Coast. Mm. You've seen the video, if you have not, when I went to the last bath yeah. and what that represented. You see, uh, this system has a way of pretending that the past has no reference to today. Mm -hmm. They are currently uh, working on erasing that by removing the books out of school that would tell the story of why African people are at the bottom of everything that is good and at the top of everything that is bad. And if we don't know the truth, then we do not know that even though he speaks of his mother and father that are still together, mm. in their time, they're gonna have to bear the pain of what it's like to stay together through the challenges and call that love. Because sometimes love in our community will show up like that. Because who are we going to measure our love against? The same people that have had us in captivity here? Huh? Should we say, mm, goodbye, honey, bring back the bacon? No. Their story is different from ours. So 
I could understand what the brother here when he said that his role now is to be the loving nurturer. What his daddy couldn't do is now his role to do. Huh? What he is doing is clean, doing his part in his time. Without even knowing sometimes the nuance of how we even got here. Yeah. History. His story, our history in this country, the trauma is rolling from one generation to the next. Yeah. And rather than blame the source of our discontent, we blame each other. Come on. Um, so... You know, I'm going to take a pause there. Right. It's a good time to pause. And when we come back, uh, my young brother here is going to do a poem to start the process. So uh, bear with us as we uh, continue on the other side.